So um, we're going to talk for a little bit, and we're hoping that you guys have some questions, and we'll try to answer those, and then we can all go home. But thank you very, very much for sitting through this. We really appreciate it. Um, just a little bit of uh, look ahead. The film opens in New York on Friday. Um, a week after that, it opens in about, what, 20, 20 other cities. And a week after that, it opens in a number of other cities. And depending on how many people show up, we'll see what happens. But we're very excited about that. And on Thursday, um, the film actually opens in Mexico on 15 screens, right? Isn't that right? I think like 30. 30 screens? OK, close. Um, so what I'd like to do is, is start by, maybe Matt, you can give the, the, the people here a little bit of an update. Matt was just in Mexico earlier this week uh, supporting the release. And um, so start with Dr. Morales. What's his status? So the doctor uh, is still in jail. Uh, it is to almost the year uh, to the day. Uh, he's been in jail for a year. Um, there's been no due process, no trial. Unclear whether he'll be in prison for you know, another week or another you know, five years. So um, we, don't, we don't know. And there's some support in Mexico to release him, and, but there's also there are some. No, there are a number of activists in Mexico you know, working to try to get him out of prison, but uh, he remains uh, where he is. He's actually just about to end a three-day hunger strike. Um, which, as a diabetic, is not an ideal thing to be doing. But um, and, and the government's relationship with the with the auto defenses that they legalized the rural defense force. Um, what's the status of that? Uh, Castillo, who was the security commissioner for Mitch O'Connor, maybe you can talk about those two. Things. So the yeah the commissioner uh, that was appointed by President Peña Nieto, who uh, you saw on the screen, uh, several times on the screen. Uh, Castillo, who is his like attaché in, in Michoacan, uh, has been fired, and uh, the Rural Defense Corps, which is what the auto defense has become in, in the end of the film, um, are so, sort of still functioning. Uh, Papa Smurf is still sort of the leader, um, but the cycle of violence continues in Michoacan. Uh, there was just a shootout the other day with 40 people who were killed. Um, there also was the murder of 43 students soon after we stopped filming. Right, right after we finished filming uh, in, a, in the state of Guerrero, which is just south of Michoacan, uh, 43 students were uh, kidnapped by the police and then handed over to the cartel and uh, incinerated, um, which was awful. And it you know, created a sort of national and international outcry. I'm sure most of you have heard of, heard of it. And, and what about Naylor, Tim Foley? Naylor uh, is still doing his thing. He's still on the border. He's still, um, guys are still going down to, to work with him, and he's still uh, operating on the border. Yeah, in fact, I think we spoke with him earlier this week, and I think today he's leaving for a 10-day adventure on the border. Um, okay, let's talk about risk, because it's impossible to watch this film without feeling the risk that you took personally. Um, my job, just to be clear, was to sit in New York and worry a great deal, <laughs> which I got really good at. Um, I worked for many years in network news myself and went to a lot of terrible places, but I never did what you did, which is to go back again and again and again and encounter the same people and get them to know you and also for them to know what you know. So maybe it would be interesting for you, Matt, to talk a little bit about how your sense of the risk evolved. Uh, I mean, the first trip that Matt took there, um, we, we hired a team. Matt found a team of, of local people to support him and a very small group. And we brought on a, a security firm. And Matt wore a beacon. And there was an extraction plan, as if that would actually work. Um, and gradually, we, we, we decided to stop doing that. But did your sense of the risk, did you think it got riskier? Do you think it got safer? Just talk about how it evolved over the eight or nine months that you took more than a dozen trips to Mexico. Well, I mean, when I first went down there, I thought I was going down there for a week. Um, I thought I'd get enough footage to you know, create this parallel <laughs> story. And uh, nine months later, um, we stopped filming. I think I went down you know, roughly sort of one to two weeks of every month. Um, I think Tom, my girlfriend, 
Uh, my parents thought I was somewhat mentally ill um, by continuing to go down there. But I, you know, I became sort of obsessed with trying to understand what was happening, who these guys really were. Um, when I first went there, it seemed simple. It seemed like it was this sort of classic Western hero villain story of guys in white shirts fighting against guys in black shirts. And quickly, I realized that that was not the case, and that the lines between good and evil were much more blurry. Um, Did that make you feel safer or more uh, at risk? Definitely more at risk. Um, you know, you could be on an operativo, on a mission with these guys, and you really, truly didn't know if you were with the good guys or the bad guys. And that was a really scary environment to film in. Um, you know, it was really sort of, I'm not a war reporter. I've never been in situations like this before. My last film was on healthcare. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and just to be clear, I mean, you know, if you check the statistics, there are a number of, but dozens of journalists over the past decade and a half have died in Mexico reporting on this story. So the risks are not abstract. Um, the risks are very real. Um, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, and did having the camera, I mean, I've, when I would go out as a producer, I never shot anything. Matt, as you know, shot almost all of this film. Um, did having the camera give you a sense of security? Does it feel safer when you're out there and you've got a camera in front of your eye? I don't know if it made me feel safer, per se, but it, I think it calmed me down. Um, as I said, I, you know, I've never been in situations like this before, and you know, even that, that first shootout, um, we wore bulletproof vests every day and um, always anticipated that that was a possibility. Uh, and, you know, I, I thought it was very important to capture on, on film. Uh, that particular day, though, uh, the auto defensive commander that I was with uh, was buying a car at a local car dealership. And so I thought we were in relative safety. So I wasn't wearing my vests or, or anything. And boom, they get a call and they say they know where these two assassins are. Everyone throws on their jackets, which I didn't have with me, and they, you know, jump in the car and drive about 100 miles an hour through the city to this warehouse where these guys were. And, you know, and 10 minutes later, I was right in the middle of this thing. So for me, being behind the camera, I think, calmed me down. Um, just focusing on the craft of filmmaking, focusing on focusing, focusing on exposing, focusing on making sure the record button was on, um, that sort of calm me down a little bit in these, in these situations. But when you, I mean, when you would come back to New York, I, I, I could see that you were shaken many times by what you saw. Did, how did you get up the stupidity, I mean nerve, I mean courage to go back? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was like a, it was a very bizarre nine months and that still obviously stuck with me. Um, To go from that to Manhattan, you know, I mean, even to go from that to Mexico City, you know, they're different. There's, there's many different Americas, there's many different Mexicos, um, but Mitch Rokan is a world away from Ma Manhattan, that's for sure. So to come home to Manhattan was, was very bizarre. Um, but, you know, I wanted to keep telling the story. So. And, and we've talked about this, but I, I'd love for you to share it. Um, you've, you've said often that the scariest part of this really wasn't being in the shootout. Yeah, I think, you know, despite all of the like bang bang moments or whatever, by far the scariest moment for me, um, the moment that stuck with me the most uh, was the interview that I did with Milagros, the young woman whose husband was kidnapped with her. Um, and to sit in this room next to this woman and to look at her and to look into her eyes and see this body that was there, but her whole soul had been sucked out of her. Um, and to hear describe these horrors and to think that we're the same species of human beings that would do that to other people, that stuck with me much, much more than, than anything else, so, um, and to this day. So I just want to do a little uh, film 101 here and dissect a couple of the scenes. Um, the scene... You're, enjoy, you're enjoying this a little yeah, second question. Yeah, I am. I like being that, yeah. Um, the scene in which the, uh, um, you, you, you're in the back of the car and suddenly the shooting starts, and the next thing you know, they find this guy in a white car that isn't the one that shot at them, but the, and then they grab him and kidnap him, essentially. 
how did that happen? Did you know that was coming? I mean, talk about the process that led to you being there. So I think, you know, a lot of people ask me sort of how I got the access to, to various scenes. I mean, um, most of it was time, you know, spent. There were other journalists covering the story, uh, especially Mexican journalists. Um, but they sort of come in for one day, two days, three days. And it's really difficult to tell the story. I, I mean, I couldn't do it in three or four days. Um, and that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to really have the story arc and show the rise and then ultimately the fall of the auto defensas. Um, but over these nine months, I, I forged you know, deep relationships, uh, obviously with the doctor, with Naylor, um, and with many, many different people on the, uh, in Mitchell Khan on the good side and the bad side. And you know, so I had you know, a Rolodex of people on WhatsApp, on a texting service, uh, as well as my local crew, and we're constantly in communication with with a number of people. Um, in this particular instance, we are in a town called Yerapan, uh, which is the second biggest city in Michoacan. And it was near the end of the story. And you know, I'd been on many, many different operations with them. And in this particular one, uh, they had two of their members killed uh, recently. And so they were very much on edge, very much wanted to find those who did it. and. Uh, suddenly, they sort of were just sitting there waiting, and then and then they all start jumping in their cars, putting on their bulletproof vests, and putting magazines in their guns. And I said, you know, can I come with you? And they said, well, we're going to get uh, Starbucks. <laughs> and I said, well, I'd love some coffee too. And so, um, yeah, I mean, and then I don't really speak Spanish. Um, so, he means that. He doesn't really speak Spanish. I, I've, I'm very bad with languages, and so I understood about 50 to 70 percent of what was being said, I, and I had a lot of trouble communicating. Um, so I didn't really know what the mission that they had to go on was. And then, you know, soon after they started getting shot at, and, you know, obviously that scene where we jump out of the car, and it was this, you know, crazy witch hunt um, to find those who were shooting, and obviously they, were just, they just found a guy who happened to be driving the same color car, who may or may not have had a connection to organized crime and at some point. how long were you, you were in the back seat with them for? For about long. an hour, I mean, obviously it's like a, I don't know, three minute scene in the film, but that was like a, literally a one take for probably an hour until my card ran out. Um, just jammed in the back of that car with this guy um, interrogating him, and that was what was so difficult more as a human being to film a lot of these stuff, especially that and the, and, and the torture. Um, as a human being, you obviously want to you know, grab them and do something, but I'm not, you know, I'm not there to police. I'm not there to judge. I'm there to document what I'm seeing. And when you went in the, and witnessed the, the torture at the auto defense this camp, I, how, did you, how come they didn't just kick you out? Um, they did kick me out a number of times. Um, I knew that. That was a leading question. I knew the answer, but I think it's a good story. T talk about that a little bit. They, um, they didn't obviously didn't necessarily want that filmed. Um, certain members of them did. I mean, there's always I always had somebody on my side. Um, somebody who said, you know, Matt, this is really important to show. This is what's really happening. Um, you should be here filming this. And then often I'd have people intimidating me and saying, don't film this, especially there. And that particular place, this torture chamber that happened to be a halogen lit, enormous bathroom, um, which is where they brought all these people and interrogated them and, and, and tortured some of them, um, that was shot over five days with me sort of sneaking in, pretending like I was going to the bathroom, recording sound, um, holding the camera like by my side, Sort of talking to people, hoping that I was somewhat in frame. Um, and Did not speaking Spanish help you in a situation like that? Yeah, I mean, often I'd be like, I, "Sorry, I, I don't understand what you're saying," and I would just stay there. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> he says the same thing to me, by the way, and I think he does speak English. What? Yeah, well, yeah see, <laughs> um, I want to I want to dissect one more scene, and then I'm hoping you guys have a few questions. Um, the, the sort of turning point in the film is the scene where Papa Smurf goes in front of 
that town and <clears throat> tries to convince them how important and effective their work is, and the town kind of turns on him. Talk about how you got that scene. Was that the first time you, I mean, did you know when you were shooting it? I mean, how did it, how did it come to be? I mean, it was almost a joke with our crew how many Papa Smurf speeches we filmed. I think I probably filmed 15 Papa Smurf speeches. Um, in this particular one, I, I was just like, I can't film another Papa Smurf speech. And so, um, but there's something in the air, something that, I don't know, I decided to film one last one, and it just happened to be this amazing scene. And, you know, thank God for documentary film, because you get these scenes that just get laid in your lap. And that guy that we, we in the edit room called Charlie Rose, um, <laughs> from the crowd who basically asked all the questions that I wanted to be asking, um, but he kindly did it for me. Um, it was a really important film, scene. You know, it was obviously a turning point editorially. And one of the things that we tried to do in the editing process was, you know, it was a crazy experiment trying to get the film done for Sundance. And we had three editors as well as myself cutting. And um, it was this crazy sort of workshopping environment where we, we all sort of had our hands in each scene. Um, I lost my train of thought. Papa Smurf. Oh, so it, one of the things that I said every day with having, you know, four editors um, was, you know, my mantra always was, let's try to recreate that energy uh, that I felt in the field. Every time, there's many moments while filming this uh, where I felt like the rug was pulled out for me. And I thought I understood what was happening, and then the story just changed and changed back again. And so I wanted you, as an audience member, to go on that sort of roller coaster of a journey uh, that I went on. And obviously, that that speech was one of them. Okay, we have about ten minutes left. I'd love to back in the back here. Uh, thanks so much. That was a really fantastic film. We thought we might slip out early and sat in the back, but we couldn't. It was so interesting. Um, I work with the Committee to Protect Journalists, so a lot of what I was viewing through this film um, made me think of you know, the 32 journalists who have been killed in Mexico covering crime since 1992 and the fact that nine out of 10, you know, they're never brought to justice of any sort. And then I hear you saying that you have never been to this sort of situation. So could you talk about how you prepared, um, what sort of security training you got, how you kept your local fixers and translators safe, and what sort of precautions you guys took in advance, but also now that it's about to come out um, in the theaters. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we didn't do any sort of formal risk training, although in retrospect probably should have. Um, we, we talked to a number of journalists uh, who were covering the story in Mexico, who had been covering the story for years, understand uh, what sort of risk we were entering into. Um, every morning, we had a slew of journalists that we'd call, tell them what roads we were driving on uh, in case we got kidnapped, what towns we were going to in case we got kidnapped. Um, in the beginning, as Tom said, we had a security firm tracking us with a little beacon that we had in our car. Um, and it became very clear that that wasn't at all helpful, so we stopped uh, doing that. Um, but I mean, so much of it is just sort of situational aware awareness and, and you know, understanding the dynamics. Um, and we've also been in consultation with groups in Mexico now about the security of the people we worked with there, and we're working real hard on that. But there's no question that it's there's some real risk. The, um, I mean, the I think every day about my local crew, especially one local crew member who's, you know, who's from the region. Um, I was actually just emailing with him just before this about risks, and um, it's real. I mean, it's something that we, we think about. You know, we've been, we've been in touch with Article 19, who I'm sure you know, which is an organization, a nonprofit that uh, protects journalists around the world. Um, so we're doing everything we can. Right here. Oh, here comes a mic. There you go. That seemed interesting to me is from the very beginning, uh, the group seemed to be very heavily armed. Uh, it, where'd all the arms come from? Where'd they get the money to buy them? Who gave it to them? I mean, they looked like a fully equipped military in, in the movie, at least. 
Which side of the border? On the Mexican side of the border. Um, well, it's sort of revealed a little bit in the end of the film, but uh, the meth cookers were providing them drugs, excuse me, guns, uh, money. Um, the businessmen, local businessmen, were providing money and guns. Uh, you know, they didn't want the Templars around, and so they felt like the auto defenses were their way of not being extorted anymore, were their way of bringing peace and uh, security to Mitchell Khan. And so there's many rich businessmen in Mitchell Khan, many rich businessmen from Mitchell Khan who had left either to Jalisco, to the States, um, the United States, as well as other states in Mexico, um, who, who sent money down. There were people in in the United States sending money down, uh, just regular people. I mean, they were literally, some people would have like, you know, cupcake drives and, you know, Modesto and uh, places all across America sending money down. Um, There's a deep connection between Mitch O'Connor and the U.S. Uh, a lot of people, including Dr. Morales, lived in the U.S. And from the beginning, from Matt's first trip there, we had heard rumors that um, part of the auto defenses was really a sort of stalking horse for other cartels. Uh, but at first, we found that hard to believe, but as you saw in the film, you know. Well, and a big lesson really quick is that there's obviously a big theme in the, in the third act of the film is this idea of the forgiven ones. The doctor was always against the forgiven ones. The forgiven ones were former Templars who weren't like assassins, but were like mid-level operators, and they were very important to help the auto defenses keep moving forward. They were very important providing information on where certain people were, and you know the doctor was always against accepting them into uh, the movement, whereas other people within the movement thought it was really necessary. And the forgiven ones, you know, obviously had guns and uh, other things as well. So right here. Um, do you think he was he was going to be the doctor was going to be assassinated in your own opinion in the plane? And also, it seemed like there was a rise that he stood for a really moral um, line. And at the end of the movie, it seemed like there were questions or there were things brought up about his infidelities. And then what I wanted to ask you also was, how did you get so close to him when he was with the woman that he met at the end to get that, that dialogue? Take that last one first, because I think, how did you get that scene? Um, what was the first question? I'm going to forget it. Right. I mean, every single time I got in the car with him, you know, that was also really scary, just even being in a car with him, because it felt like he had a bullseye on his back. Um, and if it wasn't my dad's 70th birthday, I would have been on that plane with him. Um, but... Um, I, to me, I didn't want to create a whitewashed portrait of anyone in this film. You know, you're complicated, I'm complicated, We're, we as human beings are complicated. And so I wanted to really portray that complexity, portray the um, complexity of what drives men and women to take up arms. I mean, this is a story that's both, you know, timely and timeless. I mean, we've seen armed groups rise out, rise up to protect their towns, protect their families throughout history. We see it playing out throughout the world today. We'll continue to see it throughout our future. And so I wanted to sort of show the complexity of that and show the complexity of him. Um, you know, everyone sort of, some people call him a hero, some people call him a flawed hero, some people call him a villain. I mean, everyone sort of takes something different away from him. Uh, I'll withhold, since this is being recorded, my own opinion. You can ask me afterwards if you'd like. <laughs> How do I get so close? Time. I mean, I spent... Well, also, he's wearing, he was wearing a microphone from the moment he woke up in the morning until at night, and, and once you do that for a long period of time, but he clearly knew it was there, and that is also a scene that lasts a lot longer than we portrayed uh, in the film, and it has other things in it that would have made us not probably get worse than an R rating, which is how the film is currently rated. So, uh, but then, I mean, that scene when he gets in... The first scene, when Carla gets in the car... Uh, and he you know, puts his hand on her leg. Um, 
I mean, that was the first time I, I just couldn't believe that was actually happening right in front of me. Um, Matt, Matt, Matt called me after that and said, you will not believe what happened and started telling me. And I said, well, does he know her? No, he's never met her before. Who is she? We have no idea. It's unbelievable. Anyway, um, who's got another one? Back in the back here. We can. And then we'll have two more, one there and one here. And then we're done. Thank you. You guys have been very kind. So on the American border side, right here. Yep. So on the American border side, um, the language of vigilante, my mind kept going to George Zimmerman. And um, it was interesting to watch Fox News on television to, to just kind of hear their rhetoric about protecting this land. So, um, I mean, this, this is somewhat of a tangent, but I think it's relevant that it was almost like this protection of, of white supremacy. And so it, 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 was, it was a profound thought for me in a context of everything that's happening in America. Um, and it may not be at the forefront of your thinking, but I was just curious if you had any thoughts about what they were, I mean, beyond just protecting the land, did you get a sense of them protecting something beyond that? Is, was there a protection of whiteness as well? <laughs> people, are, people are answering for me. I, I can uh, take a pass at that after you. I think... That's also what I wanted to show with this film, is that when, when these groups rise up that are outside the law, then when these vigilantes group, groups rise up, and we see that really vividly in Mexico, um, despite perhaps noble intentions of, of the leadership, you can't control who's within your group. And that often leads to the downfall of that group. We see that in Mexico, uh, and in, in the case of Arizona, you know, Naylor, you know, regardless of how, you know, I think a lot of people take, view him in different ways. Um, again, I'm, I'll withhold uh, my personal opinions, but I think um, he can't control, he needs men. And so, I mean, we saw very vividly, you know, one of his men uttering, you know, some of the most, you know, disgusting racist uh, language, you know, I'd ever heard. Um, and that was his motivation. That was his reason for being there. Um, everyone had their own reason for being there. And Naylor um, says that in the film. And Naylor, yeah, Naylor does say that in the film, <laughs> that um, you know, I can't control uh, who's, who's coming down here to, to help with my cause. Um, so I think, I think that's actually one of the, in my opinion, one of the parallels with both of these stories, uh, is the complexity of the group dynamic. And, and when government breaks down the way it does in Mexico and also has on the border in Arizona, the vacuum is filled, and it isn't necessarily filled with people who have any accountability, and that can lead to a lot of things. Okay, last question right here. You guys have been wonderful to stay, by two, the way. I know it's late. Two-minute warning. Matt, forgive me. I don't know some of the other projects you've worked on, but I could imagine that this project uh, was a life-altering event for you, conceivably. Um, how does this project, and having worked on this project, shape the kinds of projects that you're apt to consider next. <laughs> uh, I mean, I could lie down on the couch and we could talk. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's I mean, it changed me a ton, obviously. Uh, I think I'd be inhuman if it hadn't changed me. Um, it changed me as a filmmaker, changed me as a human being, uh, you know, and I, I sort of, I want to continue making films like this, films that are unpredictable, films that um, you don't know where it's going to go. And a mentor of mine in the film world, you know, this is sort of cliche advice, but once said, if you end up with the story that you started with, then you weren't listening along the way. And that's, I think, not only good advice for life, but uh, for filmmaking as well. And hopefully, I'll continue to make films that uh, you know are relevant in that sense. So, um, well, thank you guys. Very, thank you guys very much. so much. Really appreciate it.